Okay, so Harry in this episode is talking all about him and his helicopters. And you guys know how much I despise all of the Afghanistan talk. It's just so much nonsense. It's just so much trash. Um, I think the thing is, is that, as I've said before, when Harry writes about being in the military, he is like, you know what he's like? He is like a homeschooled 14 year old whose con very conservative parents have finally allowed him to watch Saving Private Ryan. And now he's all jacked up on secondhand adrenaline and he decides he's gonna sit down and write something because now he knows some stuff. That's the way this whole war section plays out. Him and all his little terms and all his little words and all this. It was all fine in the end and really he couldn't think too much about it because now it's time for him to go to Afghanistan. And he says everybody was real jittery, but not him because getting in the airplane to go and fly to Afghanistan was a home going for him. It was him going home. Okay, I mean, like, then, then you weren't experiencing what everyone else was experiencing. If this, if, if, if flying to a war zone is a homecoming for you, then you were exceptionally sheltered the last time you were there. Okay, so he says it's a homegoing. Um, he wants to let you know he's been promoted as a captain. Also, he's excited because this time he gets to fly with the other soldiers, so he's not just you know, in that, like, hiding in that little bunkhouse behind the cockpit. But now he writes, this time I was allowed to sit with all the other soldiers to feel part of it, to feel part of a team. And I circled the word feel. Isn't that interesting that even he knows he isn't? Y you, you get to feel like one of the soldiers. Well, aren't you one? I don't know. It's almost like he knows that there's a differentiation. Um, also, by the way, his bodyguards are with him this time. So at least he's admitting this time that they were there. He says, now both my bodyguards um, were coming. Because unlike my last tour of duty, I had bodyguards this time. Mainly because there were proper accommodations for them. And because they could blend in. I was living with thousands of others. Well, you were too before, weren't you? Well, I guess he was, you know, in that outposting place. But, you know, to, for him to act like he had no one watching him, please. No one believes it. Then he talks a lot about what would happen when, you know, as an Apache pilot... He, like what they would do while they were waiting to be called into service. So they basically just sat around in this tent, drank a lot of coffee, played a lot of video games, looked at a lot of porn magazines, apparently. It's like, what are you, what are you looking at that for? With everybody? What is that? Um, you know, and he just does a lot of annoying talk like, I felt naked. I had my 9mm, but my SA-80A was locked up. I had my bodyguards, but I needed my Apache. That's the only place I'd feel safe and useful. I need to rain down fire on our attackers, whoever they were. You know, so he's talking about a time in which there was some sort of, you know, imminent threat. And, you know, he was waiting to go and rain down fire on his attackers. Well, one time that in that same episode, you know, everyone's freaking out. They don't know what's going to happen. But apparently what had happened to cause the disturbance there had been a couple of Taliban fighters who'd got a hold of American uniforms and got a hole in the fence and had slipped in and they cut a hole in the fence to get to Prince Harry they said they were looking for him and you know he says the Taliban actually issued a statement Prince Harry was our target and the date of the attack had been carefully chosen as well they timed it they proclaimed to coincide with my birthday how dare that what kind of a birthday gift is that <laughs> I didn't know if I believed that. I didn't want to believe it. But one thing was beyond dispute. The Taliban had learned about my presence on the base and the granular details of my tour through the nonstop coverage that week in the British press. You know, the, what is the British press supposed to talk about? You know, there is a war going on and their prince happens to be there. I think that they might make mention of it from time to time. And it isn't as though they've got some, you know, they don't have some rat from within giving your your specific global coordinates. I mean, there's no way that their their press coverage informed the Taliban. So why are you always making these dumb connections that couldn't possibly be true? Um, he talks more about how he talks a lot about sitting in that tent, but he he talks about. I, Something that happens in this chapter or in this section of readings is he makes a lot of references um, every time his grandmother is brought up, every time Queen Elizabeth is brought up. 
he writes about her as though she's just kind of this like little old fuddy daddy funny little old lady he as he's talking about sitting in that tent there was a red phone that was, was positioned it didn't have any buttons on it or anything it's just just the phone and the cradle and you'd pick it up when it rang and they would tell you where you were gonna go and then he says he's like the alarm itself was a phone, red, plain, no buttons, no dial, just a bass and handset. Its ringer was an antique, consummately British. Ring. The sound was vaguely familiar. I couldn't place it at first. Eventually, I realized it was exactly like Granny's vote at Sandringham on her big desk in the huge sitting room where she took calls between games of bridge. Like she's just this old lady just playing bridge, you know. I just don't know like it's just these like little phrases where it's just like he's just kind of throwing some some vague disrespect like why did he have to bring her up into it it's just like he just wants to he just wants to be overly familiar about her to us like i get to say that she's just kind of like this old lady who like plays bridge and stuff and like sometimes takes an important call from time to time i just don't i just can't with him um he tells us about his um co-pilot Dave who was really um a skilled individual far more skilled than he because he'd been there for three tours already you can imagine where Dave's mental state was um he says that he was hard for him with Dave because Dave's sense of humor was difficult to understand um he said that Dave he, like he could never understand if Dave was being funny if he was being sarcastic if he was being serious I can assure you Dave was being serious 100% of the time um he goes on this long jag about how every time they flew in the helicopter they were really heavy because they had all these 30 millimeter rounds and you know a lot of stuff and how he resented the feeling of being pulled down to earth when all he wanted to do was to just go rain down fire on the attackers um and he talks about how at one, at one point they lifted off the light was flashing that they needed to land because they were too heavy and he says that, then I thought, maybe we could just ignore the warning light. Okay, if your Apache helicopter is warning you to land because you're too heavy, I don't think you just get to ignore that. I mean, but is that, that, isn't that just so indicative of the way he's lived his life? Warning lights going all over the, off, all over the place and he just plows on. Like, I, mean, I don't really think there's much of a consequence here. I don't think it really matters. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay. Um, and he says that Dave, you know, thank God for Dave. Dave's like, we're landing. So Dave turns back around and goes back to the base. And he says that, fine, you know, Dave was a more experienced flyer. Um, he says he'd already done three tours. He knew all about those warning lights. Some you could ignore. He blinked all the time. He pulled out the fuses to shut him up, but not this one. Okay, but presumably you had like two years learning how to fly this thing and you think that you can ignore the light that tells you, hey, you better land because you're too heavy and you're going to crash if you don't. Like, he, he's over there thinking that you could ignore that light. He, but it goes, this is the thing that was really like, oh my gosh, you petulant child. I felt cheated. I wanted to go, go, go. I was willing to risk crashing, being taken prisoner, whatever. Do you not understand what would happen to you if you crashed, taken prisoner? What are you talking about? You want to just gamble? Not only with your life, but also with Dave's life? I just wanted to go, go, go. The silly little light was blinking telling me I better land, but I didn't want to. And it go, go, go. Go, go, go straight into the pits of hell. Um, let's see. What else does he say? Uh, he talks about you couldn't find the Taliban. They're really hard to find. Yeah, okay. Well, it is guerrilla warfare, so imagine that. Um, then he goes on to tell us that he was the first in his squadron to pull his trigger in anger. That doesn't seem like something I'd want to brag about. Um, he says that it was always really frustrating because they'd get a sight, they'd see the Taliban, they would confirm that it was indeed Taliban, it wasn't any civilians, it wasn't anybody that they on their side or on our side or on the American side, they could confirm and they'd call in for permission and those jokers would never come back with permission in a timely fashion. So he goes on and on about, you know, if everybody else was as fast and as quick as I was, so finally I just had to pull the trigger and kill someone. And he says the first time that he 
killed somebody and knew that he'd killed somebody because the Apache did have, they recorded every kill. So you'd, you'd go and then you'd come back and you'd watch the, the kill footage and, you know, confirm that it had been done. The first time he did it, he came in and he did a mental scan. I'd been in combat before. I'd killed before. But this was the most direct contact with the enemy ever. In other engagements, it felt impersonal. This one was eyes on target, finger on trigger, fire away. And I asked myself how I felt. Traumatized? No. Sad? No. Surprised? No, prepared in a way. Doing my job, what we're trained for. Okay, so he goes on to like be scared if he's getting callous and desensitized, but then he's like, no, it's my job. Simple maths. They're the bad guys, we're the good guys. Okay, you know, I got no problems with him saying that because that is the way of war. Okay, you get all caught up in what it is that you're killing another human being. Okay, you probably can't do your job. Okay, so I'm, I'm fine if that's what he has to say. But what I, I, if he'd stopped there, if he'd stopped there and maybe not told us so much about when he like killed the guy, it's just, it just seems like dangerous to talk that much about what you were up to and putting your name on certain kills. And like, they know when you were there, they know a region you were in. Just seems dangerous to be maybe letting the enemy know even at this late date what you were up to because it's not like the Taliban has been conquered. I mean, who knows what they could be up to. And, you know, and of course we're going to hit the part in the book where he does his famous telling us about the 25. It just wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to the story. He really could have told all of this in much vaguer terms than he does. Um, but it just comes across as so much bragging. And it's just unbecoming as, it's unbecoming to a soldier to, to, to speak that way because it, it like you, you, you do what you have to do, but you don't have callous disregard for the lives that you did have to take by just talking about it like it's just no thing. I don't know. Um, it just doesn't seem like a classy move to me. Um, oh, but this is the thing that I was like, okay, I'm going to file this into things that did not happen. He says that um, he was always really aggressive with these Taliban and, 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 and you know, they, they rode around on these motorbikes and, you know, he, he'd be flying over them and going after them and, you know, getting them in his sights and, you know, just knocking the motorbike right out from underneath them and killing them in the road. And he says that much later, speaking about it with a mate, he asked, did it factor into your feelings that these killers were on motorbikes, the chosen vehicle of paps around the world? Honestly, could I honestly say that while chasing a pack of motorbikes, not one particle of me was thinking about the pack of motorbikes that chased one Mercedes into a Paris tunnel? Or the packs of motorbikes that have chased me a thousand times? I couldn't say. Okay, your male friend didn't ever sit you down and be like, dude, you ever think about the fact that those Taliban are on motorbikes and so are the paps? You ever think about that? Make that connection, man? That's deep. No guy ever said that to you. No guy would ever even think of that. You know who asked him that question? The real person who asked him that question was Meghan Markle, trying to get into his head and make him see connections and reopen the mummy wound. That's who asked him that question, but he couldn't say that. So he said, a mate said, you know, mate asked him. No, he didn't. That is so much BS, I can't even stand it. I mean, <laughs> motorbikes are the way a lot of people in a lot of countries travel, okay? It's got nothing to do with PAPS. So if you cannot get your mind out of that world of paparazzi, um, and your mom and all this, then you are not in a state of mind to be sitting as the gunner in Apache helicopter. Just, you know, just my random opinion, but you know. Um, he goes on like every single one of these chapters about, and then I killed this guy, and then I killed that guy, and then I circled around and killed another guy. It's just like, you don't have to tell us every time it happened. You really don't for your safety and others. I would, I would advise against it. Um, and he says here, he makes this analogy for us, um, which he's later going to be offended at anybody for, for noticing that he made the analogy. But he says that when he was up in the helicopter and it was his job to be taking people out while Dave was flying, he says, the thumbstick I fired was remarkably similar to the thumbstick for the PlayStation game I had just been playing. The missile hit just short of the motorbike spokes. 
textbook. Zappy would have been taught to aim. Too high, you might send it over the top of his head. Too low, you take out nothing but dirt and sand. Delta Hotel, direct hit. Delta Hotel, please. Nobody knows what that means. Um, so he just finished saying that in his mind, he it was so much like playing video games. Later on, uh, um, he'll say something similar to a journalist who is like, oh, wow, that seems a little calloused. And then he was offended at them for thinking it was calloused. Okay, well, that is probably how you had to think about it. You couldn't think about it as another human being. We could get that. We can understand that. We're not so against you that we can't understand the, you know, sort of the mental place you had to be, the mental, the mental gymnastics you need to, to do in order to kill another human being in a war zone. Okay. But you don't need to get all uh, mad at us, but you said it first. We didn't say it. You did. He goes on about how there was this guy who would run their debriefings after they got done in the helicopter and, you know, they'd have to watch the tape and see like, okay, how did you do? And, you know, what can you improve on? And he says... He's convinced that this guy um, that was in charge was just super jealous because he'd never been in an Apache helicopter. He wasn't a gunner, so he just didn't know how it was. And so he was always trying to degrade Harry's efforts. Total jealousy. And that guy was just so eaten up with jealousy. You know, his opinion was next to dirt because, you know, he couldn't see straight. He was just, you know, because of the green-eyed monster. Um... He said the guy was always trying to provoke them, always trying to get in their heads. I'm like, why would he do that? He's trying to make you better, okay? So you, I know you think that you're awesome, thanks to all your PlayStation games, and that's really helped you. But, you know, this guy's job, his task is to run you through what you just did and help you and give you some helpful criticism. Harry has never in his whole life understood some helpful criticism. Um, he would never take it. Something that he says that I think is, again, showing some more of his inability to self-examine he said that the squadron commander the one who was tasked with walking them through the, the film had an execrable attitude which i think is ridiculous for him to say that but he was exploiting a real and legitimate fear that we all had during these debriefs a fear we all shared afghanistan was a war of mistakes a war of enormous collateral damage thousands of innocents killed and maimed and that always haunted us so my goal from the day I arrived was never to go to bed doubting that I'd done the right thing, that my targets had been correct, that I was firing on Taliban and only Taliban, no civilians nearby. I wanted to return to Britain with all my limbs, but more I wanted to go home with my conscience intact, which meant being aware of what I was doing and why I was doing it at all times. So he's annoyed because he says his squadron commander was always like putting seeds of doubt into his mind about whether what he had done had been correct, putting whether what he had done and put other people's lives in danger, basically making him undermine his own decision making, which he re re resented. But what I think is interesting is that he says he wanted to return to Britain with all his limbs, but more he wanted to go home with his conscience intact. Well, how's his conscience now? I'd like to know. Shredded, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wonder. I mean... He can take shots at his family all day long, but God forbid he make a wrong shot from an Apache helicopter down at the Taliban. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, he's so concerned about preserving his conscience, but how does he live with himself now? Now that he's taking shot after shot after shot, not at an enemy, but at his own family. Not at an allied force, but at his own flesh and blood wrong with this person immediately following that passage she talks about how you know because everything was filmed he knows exactly how many people he killed exactly and that number doesn't mean a whole lot to him but in case you want to know it's 25 so no he didn't want to know and you shouldn't have told us and i'm not going to beat a dead horse everybody everybody has like freaked out that he told ever you know he told the world how many taliban he had killed but that is dangerous what was he thinking? What was he thinking? More importantly, what was his publicist thinking? Why did they allow that number to be printed? Why did they allow this whole chapter, by the way? Because apart from the fact that, hey, that's not info we need, it's so boring. I, I, it's so boring. I was trying to read last night. This was me in the bed. I just kept falling asleep. I mean, it's just so dull. 
Oh gosh, finally it's over. Um, he says that he was totally able to make his peace with everybody he'd killed. Uh, one of the things that sort of haunted him was when he wasn't able to swoop in and help when he wanted to and when he needed to and when, you know, there was people who were relying on him and he couldn't get the okay in time. But I mean, that wasn't on him. It was on those jokers who could never answer the phone. So just note that. 